We've got something special today, Dr. Nick Begich, and I totally identify with this young man. He's from a political background, and he's an investigative reporter in our industry. But the first thing, first order of business is happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks. Happy birthday. <laughs> Yay. So this makes it an extra special presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's all yours. So, so I'm, I'm older today. I'm, I'm actually 54, um, just for ba by way of background. I have five children and four grandchildren. And uh, you don't age very much in Alaska, so I come from a pretty far away place. <laughs> um, it's good to be here. I really appreciate um, the folks that put this together. These are always difficult events, and uh, everyone takes risks in organizing these. And if it wasn't for the folks that are here today, um, it wouldn't be possible for me to be here either. So I appreciate all of you uh, coming to this presentation. Uh, I'm going to cover um, HARP, which how many people have not heard about HARP in this room? And we've done a pretty good job <laughs> over the years. <laughs> I remember when we started this, Jean Manning, who was my co-author of um, Angels Don't Play This Harp, she's floating around here somewhere um, at the conference and doing some reporting for one of the uh, new energy publications. Um, when I, when I started this work, uh, and they asked me to kind of cover what motivated me to get into this in the first place, and I, I come from a political family. My father was United States Congressman. My brother, Mark, is currently a United States Senator uh, from Alaska. Um, family's been involved in politics a very long time. Um, so you, you kind of get a nature of activism uh, as sort of a birthright <laughs> when you're born into it. Um, say that again. Alaska. So, um, sort of part of America, you're kind of detached a little bit. It takes a couple days to drive to the next state. But um, Alaska is a pretty unique place. And, you know, from, from a, a very young age, I was engaged in uh, political activity. My father was lost on a plane with Hale Boggs, who was a United States congressman. He was also the House Majority Leader just before um, the Watergate. Uh, he was also on the Warren Commission, which most of you are familiar with, is part of the Kennedy investigation for his death. And Boggs um, was an advocate for um, reopening that investigation. He was also a, a strong uh, opponent of uh, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI and was pretty vocal about it. He believed that um, government at that time was pretty corrupt, uh, and he was someone that um, stood out and stood up and, um, and made his case known. He came to Alaska to uh, campaign for my father's second election. Um, to the United States Congress, and a, a, they flew on a small plane from Anchorage to Juneau, and the plane was lost. Largest search in the history of the United States, and it was never recovered, officially. Uh, in 1993, which was 20 years later, um, there was uh, evidence uh, that came out of the FBI that said they had located the plane, two people were alive at the crash site, and never recovered. Um, for my mom, that kind of got her out of politics. She left Alaska. Uh, for the rest of us, it became um, again, a motivating factor for uh, engaging um, in, uh, in, in the kind of controversial work that myself and uh, my brothers and uh, sisters have engaged in uh, in our lifetimes. If it can happen to a congressman, it can happen to anyone, um, but the reality is people have to step up to the plate. Do what you can on the issues that are important to you. Uh, and so they asked me in the beginning of this to at least present my motivation for getting into this work in the first place. The, the other thing, uh, at the time that I started to do the research on uh, HARP, I was working for the Anchorage School District. I'd been twice elected President of the Alaska Federation of Teachers, although I'm not a teacher and never have taught. Uh, I had an aptitude for organizing, and so I was involved in that uh, work. The, the thing that, that I decided was that, you know, I had this really uh, wonderful bureaucratic job where I could make my living with my left foot, as my, my friends used to joke, <laughs> and actually focus my creative time on other issues. And um, outside of the workplace, um, science was my uh, interest area, and, it, and I always had felt and been involved in science, reading independently for most of my life. Um, and, and I felt the translations weren't there. You know, being able to take complicated ideas, bring them down into plain language so they might be useful, um, that became my interest and my motivation uh, for getting into this work in the first place. I didn't expect to be doing it uh, 17 years later. Uh, never had I been involved in work that was that long. I jumped around a bit, followed my interest, and, um, but technology became, uh, became that. HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project, uh, I ran into a very short, brief, um, a few column inches of 
uh, article in a publication called Nexus, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Uh, Duncan Rhodes, who I um, met shortly thereafter, I'd sent him an article I had written with the encouragement of friends uh, to actually take some of this uh, material that I was gathering and, and put it in written form. Um, that was published a few months later, and uh, Jean Manning read it. She was a journalist, had, had a book in publication at the time. Um, she approached me, and we agreed to collaborate um, on, on, on a writing project. Um, initially, it was going to be an article, but turned out we had way too much information. We decided we'd work together on a book, um, which I, I worked in government a long time. So we were working through this book, and I said, why don't you just come up to Alaska? You know, we'll sit down in a couple of weeks. We'll get this thing done. They had a long pause on the other end of the phone. So we can't write a book in two weeks. I'm... I come from bureaucracies, you know, you can't write 100 pages in a week, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> so uh, about six months later, we got the book done. Um, we were looking for publishers. Nobody wanted to publish it because they said it wouldn't sell. Uh, the book is uh, in several languages now. It sold, I think, around 100,000 copies in, in all languages, which for a technical book is considered pretty good. Um, but it was a catalyst, uh, really, uh, to get this idea and get the ideas um, surrounding the technology out there. The technologies were uh, invented by um, Dr. Ben Eastland, Bernard Eastland, and uh, Dr. Eastland and I became uh, friends um, in the course of all of this. In fact, he thanked me uh, a few years before his death. He says, you know, it's really tough for physicists to become well-known, and he wanted to thank me for helping in that effort, <laughs> because a lot of people know him uh, now. Uh, he passed away in uh, 2007, and, and just before he died, he participated in a closed conference uh, that uh, we had sponsored at the time I was working as executive uh, director of the Lay Institute on Technologies. Um, the Lay Institute was uh, founded by one of the heirs of Frito uh, Lay, Lay PepsiCo, um, and I was uh, doing some work for them in, in technology. But HARP, as such, started with an idea um, of Dr. Eastland's, and it was to take, um, he was actually under contract uh, to ARCO, Atlantic Richfield, which was large oil and gas company operating on the north slope of Alaska. They had um, approximately half of the natural gas um, on the north slope, and they were interested in finding markets for that gas. And he had come up with a novel concept that had defense applications, which was HARP, where you take huge amounts of natural gas, run them through um, magnetohydrodynamic generators to produce electricity, and then running electricity into a, an array, a field of antennas, uh, for the purpose of um, developing some of the things we're going to be talking about uh, today. And I'm going to deviate a little bit from what's on the, um, the menu of events for the day. We're going to cover HARP, we're going to cover the weather issues of HARP, and then I'm going to move into um, some of the other um, effects of HARP as it affects um, human beings, and then some of the parallel technologies that we've uh, uh, worked on and, and gathered data on in the interim. Um, when I was working for the uh, Lay Institute on Technologies, our primary mission was to take, again, complicated ideas, try and get them into plain language and, and get them out to the public. Uh, the founder, uh, Dorothy Lay, was, was particularly interested in mind effects, uh, the effect on consciousness. So we're going to cover some of that in the uh, latter part of um, this presentation, probably in the second hour after the break. And somebody out there is going to have to tell me when we're getting close to that break time, because otherwise I'll just keep on going. <laughs> But the first um, slide, this is uh, near my home. There's actually a visitor center. This is a Portage Glacier area, uh, and there's actually a, a visitor center there named after my father. Um, it was actually funded by the United States government uh, with the help of Senator Ted Stevens, um, whom I, my brother replaced in the U.S. US Senate later. Uh, this is um, an example of the array. These are approximately, um, approximately 20 meters uh, high, the cross diapole um, is, is, is probably about a little less than t uh, t 10 meters. Uh, there's a field of 180 antenna. These produce uh, radio, radio frequency energy. And that radio frequency energy and the way this array is configured uh, will create a cyclotron resonance. So when you can visualize this, it'd be like kind of a corkscrewing motion of energy moving up into the ionosphere, and I'll explain that in a moment, but actually kind of focusing or concentrating that energy into a relatively small area. Um, by analogy, you could think about it, uh, if I were to take a flashlight and shine it on the wall across the room, it's a narrow beam here, it's a wide beam there. Normally, radio frequency energy would follow that same kind of configuration, spread out with distance. In this case, it provides a way to focus or concentrate uh, the energy by analogy, by comparison, 
uh, similar to what a laser does with light, but a little bit different principle. The idea is to focus the energy and then manipulate that energy in various ways uh, to create a primary and secondary effects in the ionosphere. In the ionosphere, um, this is an early shot of the array. There were, I think, 48 antennae in the array at this time. Uh, it's now 180 antenna. Eventually, 360 um, will be, be in this array. Uh, last, last spring, I flew over this uh, for a program that was being put together for the History Channel. Um, and we were able to shoot uh, some pretty good images of this um, for the History Channel. And I've done a lot of work on this in terms of television. Spiegel TV did some things here in, the, uh, in Europe, BBC. Um, We've done Fuji TV. A bunch of bunch have covered it over the over the years. The 180 antenna array is is essentially here, um, and again this this will uh, increase in size uh, one more time uh, to 300 360 uh, uh, antenna. Just another image. Okay, um, this comes out of view graphs produced by Ben Eastland um, initially, and just to give some some idea of what's what's happening, we've got the Earth's surface course approximately 37. Uh, miles uh, above begins um, uh, the ionosphere extending out to approximately 620 miles. And this is the region um, that, that we're interested in as it relates to HARP. And there's a, a couple of ways that um, HARP is, is utilized. One is um, these early devices were actually called ionosphere keters. They were originated in the former Soviet Union. Um, they took a long time to reset uh, to vary the frequencies. The HARP system can reset and very rapidly, they have the ability to control it in a way that allows them to change frequency and change configuration um, pretty readily. It makes it one of the most versatile, if not the most versatile, ionosphere keter uh, on the planet. It's not the only one. Uh, there are um, ionosphere keters in, the, in, in what is Russia today, uh, northern Canada. In fact, Rosalie Bertel did some work on the ones in Canada. Uh, there's a, a system here in Europe, the uh, uh, IZICAT system, and then there's uh, China actually is developing their own. So these are kind of proliferating uh, a little bit around, around the world. Um, this is uh, the idea of focusing the energy, starting uh, graphically. This comes again from Bernard Eastland's view graphs. Uh, the array on the ground focusing into the ionosphere, uh, into a small area, which is then heated. And the idea is you can slew the beam, you can move this a beam approximately 30 degrees, so you can actually heat a, a fairly good area, approximately uh, 30 miles in diameter. And when you heat it, you can actually lift uh, the ionosphere up um, several uh, um, hundreds of uh, kilometers. And then the idea is that lower atmosphere uh, moves in. And we'll talk about what that can be used for. Um, in fact, I'll mention a couple things now. One is um, altering pressure systems below, weather pressure systems below, which kind of fits into the topic that is actually on the menu for the day. Um, the other is the idea of maybe diverting uh, jet streams as, as part of that concept of weather modification. And then the other, and this came out of the Strategic Studies Institute in London, and it was from Russian research, the idea of utilizing these kinds of instruments for incoming um, objects from space, comets, asteroids, and the like, normally would have that 30, 37 miles um, to create friction and burn up, and most of these objects do. The idea is if you could project a um, uh, a trajectory of those incoming objects and then push atmosphere up even further. You give more time uh, to break up those um, in incoming objects. The, the system wasn't designed so much for weather modification, although you'll see that in Dr. Eastland's original patents. Um, he did work for um, the European Space Agency um, on weather modification utilizing HARP instruments. Um, he did work for NASA and FEMA. Uh, on the same thing. And then his last paper that he presented, I believe, was 2005 or 2006, University of Pennsylvania, which was on um, weather modification again, but he had determined that you could manipulate uh, weather with 1,600 times less energy than he originally anticipated when he designed the system. And he felt you could do that by manipulating uh, gravity waves with this um, particular system. And in terms of technically how to do that, I can't tell you, but if you look up Ben Eastland and you look up that paper, it's something that's out there in the public domain. You can find it. Um, but again, he came in looking for a way for ARCO to make some money on natural gas. We don't have a natural gas pipeline uh, from the north slope of Alaska to Tidewater. Uh, we have trillions and trillions of cubic feet of natural gas on the north slope. Um, there's, there's lots going on in Alaska right now to try and get that gas uh, to market. And if you look, 
Um, seeing that we're in the, the Netherlands, uh, Shell right now has got huge um, oil and gas rights in the uh, Chukchi Sea, which is considered one of the biggest un unexplored um, gas and oil fields. But again, no way to get it to market. So their thought was if we could just use it right there and use it for defense purposes, and perhaps uh, they could sell an, an awful lot of gas. And so that was, that's why Ben was brought into the picture. Uh, and he created a company called Arco Power Technologies, Inc., which was later um, sold to Raytheon. And interesting about that is Raytheon was one of the original bidders on building the HARP system. And they lost the contract. They didn't get that contract. Now, Raytheon at the time was in the top 40 of the Fortune 500 companies, and Arco Power Technologies had no track record, had 30 employees, but what they did have is um, they had a cluster of nine patents. Uh, and when you have intellectual property uh, and you, you, you become essentially the only source for certain technologies within the procurement process, uh, you have the advantage. You're going to get the contract. Raytheon then bought Arco Power Technologies out, so they ended up um, with those technologies. They then sold uh, that subsidiary to uh, British Aerospace. Uh, and at the same time that happened, or approximately the same time, the project moved from the United States Air Force and Navy over to DARPA. And DARPA does the most classified research for various branches of the military and for the um, various security agencies in the United States. So they now control um, HARP in terms of its advances and its projects. Lots of academics um, are provided opportunities to utilize the instrument. This is considered a developmental prototype, so it's you know being used for lots of purposes experimentally. Um, some of them pretty good ideas, you know, and it's like you know, the, the ultimate instrument. In fact, the early um, uh, developers considered it uh, an opportunity to work with their plasma lab in the sky, which makes make some of us a little bit nervous when you think about experimental work going on, um, where you're literally. Uh, coupling uh, with a part of the natural environment with the idea that somehow you're going to be able to manipulate the energy within that area. Now, the ionosphere, I think um, Brooks was speaking before me, he was talking about solar flares and the kind of activities that uh, cause disturbances on the power grid. They also cause disturbances in the ionosphere, which affects uh, and can affect global communications. And so part of this initially was t to learn more about the ionosphere and determine whether or not we could... Um, stabilize the ionosphere during those events to facilitate communication, or conversely, purposely disturb the ionosphere in such a way as to disrupt everyone's communication and yet um, be able, because we're generating the signals to disturb it, being able to carry our own communication on. So for military purposes, uh, if you think about it, being able to knock out everybody else's communication, keep your own going, uh, certainly presents some, some pretty good strategic advantages. The other um, idea uh, on this, uh, and this kind of gives you an idea of, of one of the things that uh, Dr. Eastland uh, came up with was this um, global shield. And what he was going to do there, and I think the next one shows it, is take um, and pump energy up, use the naturally occurring magnetic field lines that surround the Earth that run from the South Pole to the North Pole as waveguides. So he'd pump the energy in using that uh, cyclic uh, resonance and then using them as wave, wave guides, spin um, ac accelerate electrons all the way around, and then as, as, as you activated these around the planet, you create a shield, and the idea was intercontinental ballistic missiles entering that field would become disrupted. You'd affect their avionics, saying that it control their flight paths and be able to disrupt them enough to cause them to malfunction uh, so they couldn't you know, deliver their payloads to the targets. And so that was his big concept. The amount of energy required and a number of uh, antennas in the array that would be required would be huge. And the ideal locations for these is the northern uh, regions or the polar regions of, of the world because you want to be close to where, um, where you can inject uh, energy into the magnetic field lines and they intersect at the poles so you don't have to push the energy quite so far. Um, and you need large supplies of uh, natural gas or some kind of fuel supply to, to, uh, to run these. So from his perspective, you know, this is kind of the ideal situation. You can have a missile defense system. Um, if we had built it back then, we would have violated the ABM treaty, uh, which was a bit problematic uh, at the time. But the idea was to utilize something you could put on U.S. soil, that you could create um, a shielding uh, system and have fuel supplies adequate to run it. So it really offered the best strategic advantage 
from his perspective. And he had had several patents in the oil and gas industry. He was a plasma physicist. That was his specialty. Um, but this became um, a, a project that was, was pretty interesting to the U.S. government. The other thing that, um, that they, they could do, um, and this gets into the water, weather modification. I'm going to go back for a second. Looking at, at this again uh, for just a moment, um, some, of the, some of the things that came out of this were the communications aspects, disruption, as I mentioned. Um, one of the other uh, th things that came out of this was the idea of over-the-horizon radar, where you'd need two of these transmitters. One would create kind of a, a cold uh, plasma, so you can kind of energize this area, create um, a plasma, and then be able to use another array and bounce the signal, go over the horizon to be able to detect incoming objects. In fact, interestingly enough, this facility was built on the over-the-horizon radar location that was originally intended for Alaska. They said, oh, the Cold War is over. We're not going to use that anymore. And they built this instead. The reality is the old um, uh, over-the-horizon radar technology is objects would come close in. They become distorted, difficult to determine you know, what they were and where they were. Um, and, and also at low, uh, low elevations, you couldn't detect anything. This type of technology would get everything from uh, cruise missiles at very high elevations coming in all the way to, uh, excuse me, cruise missiles at low elevations, intercontinental ballistic missile at high elevations. So you cover it all and not get too distorted on the way in. Um, by using, um, by using a, enough energy, you could actually create a field around those incoming objects that using gamma ray detectors mounted on satellites, which is part of that patent cluster. You could then determine which of those incoming objects were carrying uh, nuclear uh, payloads, which is you know, really important because when you think about, if you ever think about such things, um, nuclear attacks were always thought to be like 100,000 incoming objects. Some would carry uh, the really destructive force, the rest would be conventional warheads. But being able to sort those out was a big part of the problem. And so this offered not only a solution for detection, but also a um, solution for determining which were the real targets, what did you really need to knock out. And then if you could increase the power even more, you get a third aspect, which is an artificial EMP, uh, an electromagnetic pulse sufficient to knock out those incoming objects. So you know, that became pretty interesting, again, from a military perspective in, in developing the technology and moving it forward. The, the other um, area uh, that comes in is, this is the over-the-horizon radar uh, that I mentioned in the patents associated uh, with it uh, by Ben Eastland. Um, this is a, another application, communication with submarines and um, earth penetrating tomography. And there's, there's two, two applications here. Um, earth, penetrating tom earth penetrating tomography is, um, again, by analogy or by comparison, we'll be looking into the earth, um, like x-raying the earth, but you're not using x-rays, you're lo using radio frequency energy. And what they would do is take the high frequency energy coming off of HARP and pulse it or pump it. Um, into the ionosphere, and you think about it, um, think about frequency being the swing of the hammer, and every time you hit the head of the hammer, that's your pulse rate. So pulsing the ionosphere then alters it uh, from DC to essentially AC. It acts as a giant broadcast antenna uh, in the sky and sends back um, a wave, uh, a very long wavelength in the ELF range that's based on that pulse rate. And so you've got High frequency going in, manipulating in such a way, the ionosphere begins to work with you. You send a, an ELF signal back, um, back to the Earth. It penetrates the Earth and sea, um, and that facilitates communication with submarines. Also, a certain amount of that energy is reflected back, and with um, devices on the ground or aircraft traversing uh, the ground relatively uh, closely, you can then determine underground structures, nuclear facilities, tunnels, oil and gas deposits, mineral deposits of various kinds. Um, so that became pretty interesting, again, to ARCO, because they were in the oil and gas business uh, at one time. Um, they got later merged with someone else, um, bought out, uh, I believe it was uh, ConocoPhillips, bought them out on the North Slope. And, and that's another, another story for another day. The, the, the point is, um, these were all like a really nice cluster with one instrument to get a, a whole lot of bang uh, for the buck in terms of uh, technologies and applications. Um, many of you remember or, or may remember a big controversy uh, occurring in Wisconsin, Michigan, where they had these very long antennas that would generate ELF. They were like uh, 13 to 26 miles long, and they create ELF signals, which were used to uh, communicate with submarines. They had a few of these other stations, one at ADAC, Alaska, and some other places in the world. 
Um, and they create a lot of controversy because the ELF signals um, were thought to be biologically active, would affect living organisms, human beings in particular. And we're going to get into that in the second hour of, of this um, uh, presentation because uh, I'm going to get through the weather stuff in this, in this first hour as it, relates, uh, as it relates to HARP. But all of that you know, became, again, interesting from a, a perspective of, um, of, of science. And the thing that, that, that we pointed out is, is we took a look at HARP, and the book Gene and I put together used over 300 source documents to compile. Everything's footnoted, not in the back of the book, but on the page. So you can read the thing, and you can make a determination. You can go look up the source. And we did that for a couple reasons. One is when you deal with controversial issues, we both felt that it was, it was appropriate for the authors to take some responsibility for the information that we put out there. You know, if you hear a lot in conferences like this, and some people don't take that responsibility very, very seriously, and we do. If, you're, if we're asking you to, to act or do something, um, we want you to act responsibly, uh, so we give you that source material. If, if, it's, if you're not sci scientifically oriented, then at least you have something there that someone else who is can, can look at and make their own determination in the context in which we pull the data. So, you know, we approach it that way, and that's what kind of turned off publishers <laughs> because they thought, you know, that's just too technical, no one's going to be interested. But again, our job was to um, simplify it enough so we could understand it and have the conversation. Um, I know I'm talking real fast, but I only got two hours. Um, <laughs> and I know we got some language issues here too, but hopefully, um, Everyone's, everyone's catching what's necessary. If you miss it, there's plenty of stuff. It's free on my website, summation articles. You can always go to those um, and, and dig those out. Um, this, this area, though, became interesting to me because my, one of my areas of interest in, in science was, and we're really where it began uh, for me um, in, in, in terms of human beings, was the idea of enhancing human performance uh, using electromagnetic fields, whether it be... Um, uh, ele electromagnetic currents or whether you utilize uh, light, sound, different things to enhance human performance. And the idea, most of that is surrounding this idea of ELFs, extremely low frequency signals. And what became disturbing to me is the very same signals being generated here could in fact have um, repercussions uh, for living organisms, particularly you and me. <laughs> so I became more concerned at this than, than most of the other um, applications. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that. So I want to give a little bit more um, on, on what happened then. Um, in the context of, of doing this, we had the opportunity to go on uh, radio in the U.S. And I've done over 3,000 uh, radio broadcasts worldwide in the last uh, 15 years. I've been on dozens and dozens of uh, documentaries on this subject and other subjects. And at the time, you know, the Internet wasn't really very, very efficient. You know, 93, 94, 95, when we were doing our initial work, and, and it was not very reliable either in terms of information. So whenever we see something on the Internet in those days, you'd have to go to the library and do, do the real work of pulling out documents to see whether they were quoted correctly or whether they were even, even existed. Um, from time to time, they didn't even exist. <laughs> you, know, you couldn't even find the articles that people were so supposedly quoting from. So we became very careful about it. And, and we considered it um, one of the first um, uh, protests run uh, from a phone booth with a fistful of quarters uh, and utilizing what we had then. When we had then was we had fax machines, we had uh, radio uh, in the U.S., which was a big deal, uh, talk radio, and uh, we had uh, the emerging um, Internet. And, and, and our belief was that you could take a couple of people, take a complex issue, make it plain, uh, and bring it forward. And, and, we, and we did it. If somebody said, hey, you'd be doing this 17 years later on these subjects and other related subjects, I would have said in those days, no way. I just I couldn't imagine that happening. And, and I think the, the underlying message in all of that is it only takes one or two. Think about any revolution that's ever been, been fought, or, or whether it's in science, business, politics, religion, it starts with one or two. There's more people in this room than are necessary to change this whole planet. And, and I know that because that's all it requires is, is effort. And, and, and what we find in a lot of this, and I've, and I've watched it with a lot of my colleagues over the years, they get involved in a controversial issue, um, and they're first accused of being conspiratorialist, a conspiracy, conspiracy theorist. And really the best conspiracy theorists in the world are militaries, because that's their job. They're supposed to think of the most horrible situations that could ever occur, and they're supposed to think of all of them, and then build a plan to, to overcome them. That's, that's their job which is why in democracies and democratic republics uh, like the United States, 
Uh, the military theoretically is in a closet, you know, and the civilian sector regulates them because we're supposed to be conscious and aware and not the paranoid thinkers that we want our militaries to be. And that's really the reality. It's really that way. Um, if you're sitting in this room, we're having this conversation and we're in agreement, you know, we're not having a conspiracy conversation, but the guy on the outside looking in is going, uh, oh, they're conspiring to change the world <laughs> in some fashion. And I hope we are, you know, but it doesn't have to be a conspiracy. It's a matter of choice of words. <laughs> it's a plan. <laughs> and, and really, that's it. And, and even writing uh, this book with Gene, Gene had a lot stronger um, environmental position than I did. And so I'm editing out some of the, the hot words, which are like saying a nasty word in church, you know, to conservatives. <laughs> so you, d you don't really want to do that, you know, because words can really in inhibit um, the communication of what your message is. And as a result, the primary support that we've, we got initially going into this was from conservatives, because we're sensitive to the fact that you can say the same thing, you can be selective in your words, and make sure that the word forms you're using that are creating the thoughts you're trying to generate aren't offensive. Because you can still deliver the message without being offensive, but be sensitive to your opposition so that at least you have a fighting chance. If you can't swing them, at least split them. But don't do it on words that can be avoided and the same concepts delivered. And that's what we were able to do um, with, with what, both what we wrote and the way in which we delivered our, our material. And, you know, we've been at it a long time. The other thing that, that we found is, is, is a lot of our colleagues kind of fall by the wayside. And, and, and where they fall is when... They no longer stick to the, to the facts, to the, to the real information. And we get a lot of calls, well, what about this? What about that? You know, did it, you know every time there's a hurricane or earthquake, you know, I get the call. You know, was it harp? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I really do. And, and you know, and I got to always answer the same way. Could be, should be, was it? I don't know. You know, because there's no independent monitoring of the system. But I'll read you um, a quote. This is out of uh, one, one of my later books. And I'll, I'll read you the quote. Um, because it's an important one, and it comes from um, the Secretary of Defense, William Cohen, and it was at a DOD news briefing, April 27, 1997, and it was on a conference of interna on international terrorism, international um, uh, terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. Now, this is four years before 9-11, um, and this was in the DOD news briefing that, that followed, and what he said, and I quote, Others are engaging even in an eco-type of terrorism where they, whereby they can alter climates, set off earthquakes and volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves, unquote. Now that's a powerful statement for a seated Secretary of Defense to make and attribute to terrorist organizations. When you think about it, you know, the idea of stimulating these kinds of events, there's actually a treaty that forbids this. It was, it was signed by the United States in 1977. The treaty was initiated uh, by the former Soviet Union. And by the end, 60 countries, over 60 countries signed this, saying they wouldn't use environmental manipulation as, as a weapon of war. And yet, Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld, when he was in uh, the Bush administration, wanted to abandon that treaty. Uh, and his rationale was, we, you know, we've got these great technologies now. We can launch covert wars. Uh, nobody will even know we were there, and they'll invite us in for the cleanup, which is why we see so much speculation. You've got very credible people saying it's possible for terrorist states that aren't really known for high science. Um, and yet, here's the technology today. And, and HARP had that dimension for a couple of uh, different reasons. Um, the idea of, of triggering those kinds of events. I mean, think about HARP uh, in, in some applications as a primer on a, on, on, on a bullet. You know, the primer is a little, the little explosion that ignites the gunpowder, which releases uh, the, the, the lead uh, and brings it your way. In this case, one of the things they discovered um, with, with these ionospheric heaters is that if you pump energy up into the ionosphere in, in, in the very low frequency range, that all of a sudden the signal when it arrives or amplifies by up to a thousand times. It was discovered at Stanford. They're trying to figure out what the heck happened. And they hit a certain resonance that was able to, to capitalize, to release energy, because there's huge amounts of energy in the ionosphere to trigger that release of energy. I know this conference is about free energy. Well, the energy's not free, it's there. I mean, I guess it's free. One of the things that Ted Stevens said on the floor of the Senate when this was originally being funded was, hey, we might be able to figure out a way to tap the ionosphere for energy uses. And then he was quickly dismissed by the scientists involved in the project, which normally, for Ted Stevens, would have meant the end of their funding because he didn't take you know, public um, embarrassment very well. In this case, what he said is, 
we're not giving you any more money till you prove this application, earth penetrating tomography. And that was um, right after the, the first Gulf War with Bush uh, Sr. And they wanted to locate underground nuclear facilities and, and so on. And the range in which they needed the ELF signal was about 20 hertz or 20 pulses uh, per second, uh, which happens to correlate um, to, to, to the beta, beta ranges in uh, human brains. And so I'm going to get into that a little bit. How am I on time right now for this first segment? 15? OK. Um, so let me go back a little bit then. So what happened after we initiated this? We started getting calls from all over the place. Couldn't find a publisher, so uh, I cashed in my retirement, and I printed a bunch of books. And uh, I figured, well, either I'm going to have a big garage full of books, or I'm going to be able to move this thing forward. And, and my belief was, instead of going after grants, where you're beholding to grant sources, our grant sources were 15 bucks at a time from everyone that supported our effort in that way. And, and it worked. I mean, we were able to do it. I eventually had to quit my job because <laughs> I was too busy doing this. Uh, and I had to make a choice. But we started getting calls from media. We started getting calls um, from some politicians. We were able to get a hearing organized in the Alaska State Legislature uh, on the issue. Uh, Jeanette James, who ran that hearing, um, and she did it through Community and Regional Affairs. She invited um, two of the scientists from the Geophysical Institute in opposition to us, and then we were able to invite um, a couple of scientists on our side uh, to present, and we did. And, and what we did is we were going to have a series of hearings. So the first one was to, to draw out our opposition, find out where they're going to make their arguments, so we'd be able to go in. And I come from a political family, so this is the game you play. You know, you get your opposition to identify all their issues, so then you have an opportunity to refute them in a, in a more organized forum. And Ben Eastland was willing to go, uh, to go with us to the second hearing. Jeanette James was threatened by Ted Stevens, who is a, a ranking and very powerful Republican Alaskan. And he, she was told, and she said this on, uh, on television later in an interview when her career ended, um, was that if you pursue this, your career's over. And so there was never a second hearing, not there. The next hearing we had was in the European Parliament. And we were able to, to bring this issue forward. Um, I came over um, to Europe three times at my own expense. I brought over three feet of unclassified documents. Um, and, and the initial contact we got was from a conservative uh, in the European Parliament who happened to be chairing the Environmental Subcommittee at the time, which in the United States is like totally upside down, at least in those days. You don't think it conserves environmental issues. It just doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit our framework. Um, but, but it was Tom Spencer. And, and Tom Spencer was the, really the first guy to contact us. And then the next group that contacted us, which was kind of more expected, was the, the Greens in the European Parliament. And it was within weeks of each other. And we said, well, you, are you guys talking to, to Tom Spencer? And they said, no, no, he's a conservative. He's not. So yeah, you guys need to talk to each other because he's interested in the same issue you are. So the first coalition we built was between the Greens and the conservatives through Tom Spencer. And later we included the Social Democrats, which in your part of the world is pretty much the deal, right? I mean, you got those three guys talking together and working together, you might actually have a chance. So we, we came three different times. We met with a lot of people. Um, you know, we weren't funded by any big NGOs. We weren't funded by anybody. And that's, again, why I say there's enough people in this room to change the world, because there is. There's, there's enough in the front row um, to have an impact. And there's enough in the room to really, really make a change. The, the thing that, that happened is that at that time, they brought us in. There was uh, going to be a hearing. His subcommittee chair did not want to run the hearing. She was being approached by... NATO and the American mission being asked to, to shut it down. Uh, Tom Spencer, who'd never over, overridden one of his subcommittee chairs, and in the interim, he had become uh, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. You know, it's a pretty powerful committee. Um, this is the same committee that NATO had gone to um, not more than a couple years before, asking for cooperation be, because of bringing in new, new uh, NATO member states and so on uh, into that configuration. And so, Tom had gone to NATO, gone to the American mission, asked them to participate in the hearings. They flatly refused. Now, Tom Spencer was also involved in a group called uh, GLOBE, which was a group of um, legislators uh, representing uh, 44 governments, the top 200 environmental legislators in the world. Um, he brought me to Brussels uh, to lecture on HARP, and this was in their Rio Plus Five meeting just before they did the Rio Plus Five thing. And so there were three of us presenting. There was a guy from the Bologna Foundation on the 
uh, all the abandoned submarines and nuclear cores in, in the uh, former Soviet Union. Another guy on, I forget what the other guy was on. I think it was, I think it was climate change. And then me on Harp. And you know, at that time, um, I got done with my presentation. An el elderly woman approached me and says, you know, what you just delivered is the apocalypse. <laughs> I kind of, well, okay. <laughs> and she said, she says, my name is Maria Beckett, and, um, and I work for the uh, Orthodox uh, Patriarchy in Istanbul and Greece. We trace our roots to the island of Patmos and the revelation of John, and, and it's the apocalypse. And I went, oh, that's interesting. And she goes, we got a conference coming up. I'd like you to go. Um, and, and I get invited to a lot of conferences in those days. And I thought, okay, well, you know, send me the invitation. And it was a month later, I'd accepted an invitation to another conference in Germany. I get this invitation, and it's, the deal is I have to fly at my expense to Athens, and then they take care of it from there. And the invitation is from Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, and Bartholomew I. It's called the Green Patriarch out of Istanbul. And I turned that one down, and then uh, my wife at the time um, said, you know, you really accepted the wrong invitation. You should have done that one. I said, yeah, I kind of can't undo this. I've already said no. And so it was um, the next morning they faxed me another fax and say, hey, we'll cover all your expenses, please come. I called the Germans, and Germans are really organized, so they were organizing a year in advance and hadn't published anything yet. <laughs> and, and I really appreciate that because I was able uh, to be excused for that year and then, and then catch the next year. Well, on this conference was a closed conference on the Black Sea. Um, so there were uh, 400 of us uh, locked together on a ship, uh, politicians. Uh, the, the conference was called... Um, Religion, Science, and the Environment. So it was kind of a, a weird mix, uh, but a really interesting one. So we had Nobel Prize winning scientists. We had politicians from the countries surrounding the Black Sea region. We had, um, we had people represent, we had the Aga Khan on board representing Muslims. We had Jewish leadership, Catholics, um, uh, Orthodox. So a very interesting mix. And so I get there and I'm looking at the uh, agenda, and you know, mostly agendas, you know, there are a couple pages. This thing was like a book, and it was everybody's CV that was on board, their sort of abbreviated CV, and I'm looking through, and it's like the who's who. And I'm thinking, you know, what the heck am I doing on this ship, you know? And looking through to figure out where the presentation is. I'm not on any presentation. I'm a rapporteur for one of the work sessions. So I go to Maria, and I says, Maria, what the hell am I doing here? And she says, well, there's people you need to meet. They need to meet you. This has worked out. She goes, I like what you had to say in Brussels. It's okay. So, Locked on the ship with me was Tom Spencer. And so we had 12 days to map out a strategy for how we're gonna work this through the European Parliament. Um, and then he did take it on. And he took it on um, and, and brought it into the context of what became at that time, and I think still today, uh, the most um, comprehensive security and disarmament uh, resolution ever passed by the European Parliament. It was their resolution A4-0005 forward slash 99. Now we did our testimony um, in uh, actually 98. And in that testimony, I was supposed to have five minutes, um, excuse me, 15 minutes to make the presentation. They gave me the 15 minutes, then they gave me another hour and 15 minutes in question and answers from the committee to sort of clarify the points that I'd raised. And the night before, which is really different from the US, we had a, we had a closed meeting, two members of the media and the committee for five and a half hours to go over the documents, go over the stuff so they could ask good questions, which is kind of interesting. And, and hearings, public hearings in, in the U.S. are open to the public. The European Parliament, they're by invitation, which is kind of strange from my perspective. And then afterwards, you've got to have permission in order to duplicate uh, the minutes of, of the meeting. Um, we delivered our presentation on this. And the one thing I said in that hearing is I said that the Uni United States would unilaterally abandon the ABM treaty. And I said that would happen within a year, and the excuse would be there is no Soviet Union, therefore there is no treaty. It was the only point that the committee argued with me on and said, no, no, we can't accept that. And I was wrong. It wasn't a year. It was nine months later that that happened. And, I mean, this is, we're independent. You know, how do we come to the conclusion? By reading enough material to come to that conclusion uh, and, and feel pretty confident in it. And the argument made by Ted Stevens on the floor of the U.S. Senate was, there is no Soviet Union, therefore there is no treaty. And that's in the congressional record. You can look it up and see it yourself. What that did for us is really anchor our credibility. We had more knowledge than that Foreign Affairs Committee did about one of the most important bedrock issues for Europeans, for people worldwide. So when, when our sections came up, and they did come up, and they made it into the resolution, in the resolution that I just mentioned, there were three sections that dealt with HARP. 
um, sections 24, 25, and 26. Um, and then there was section 27, and I'm going to end this, this segment on this. And section 27, and I'm quoting, it says, calls for an international convention introducing a global ban on all developments and deployments of weapons which might enable any form of manipulation of human beings. And with that, I'm going to stop, and we'll pick it up uh, after the break. All right, we'll go ahead and get uh, started again. You know, where, where I left off is probably the most controversial um, area of, of, uh, of my work over the last several years, but personally, I think the, the more interesting um, subject matter. I mean, harp I've been, I've been harping on for a long time. Uh, you know, and the interesting thing about um, harp, and, and starting with this uh, illustration, and this again came from uh, Dr. Eastland's um, uh, view graphs when he first was selling this idea uh, to the Pentagon. And, and I missed just a couple things. Usually during the break, you know, you kind of remember what you miss. And usually I don't use overheads at all. I just do this thing. Um, but what, what, I, what I missed in this was he also the idea of uh, concentrating or sending energy up uh, that could then be converted um, into useful energy for low orbiting space platforms, which is a big deal um, as militaries begin to move forward. The, the idea of maintaining something in orbit at a, uh, a low uh, elevation is difficult because you have to continually take fuel uh, to keep it fueled up. In the 1960s, there was a lot of experiments trying to figure out how to pump energy up into these a low orbiting um, uh, object so that you could keep them aloft for a long period of time. And what they found is the same scientists that were associated with that 1960s research were at the Geophysical Institute working with the um, HARP system because it actually worked. Uh, Aviation, uh, Avionics Weekly, I believe, Aviation Weekly, um, did a story and it was the first test of this technology with a small array in Canada they were able to keep um, an object aloft for an extended period of time. From a strategic perspective, this is really, really important because to be able to keep something aloft for 10 or 20,000 hours by being able to send energy up and have it converted efficiently uh, to be utilized by uh, a low orbit um, uh, s space platform for military applications becomes uh, pretty compelling and pretty useful. And so I, I didn't want to miss that particular application. The other was uh, ben Eason, within his patents, had some ideas uh, for triggering um, uh, chemical reactions in the upper atmosphere for replenishing ozone, as an example, if, if you buy into that being the cause of climate change. Um, the idea of being able to replenish it, you know, seems to me would be an important issue today. Uh, the other is through uh, radiochemistry to be able to alter certain chemical constituents in the upper atmosphere to knock out methane to neutralize certain pollutants. Again, those issues were never really explored. Um, the late uh, Rosalie Bertel uh, testified with me in the European Parliament on this particular issue, went on to write a, a book of her own um, about HARP. She was a, a mathematician and a physicist, was the lead physician and statistician for the World Health Organization after Bhopal. She was considered a radiological expert, uh, mainly for victims, people that were subject to various uh, forms of radiation. And, and her, and her view of all of this um, was really the, the, the same as, as mine. It was a technology that had just gone way too far. Um, military establishment is not really known for uh, running programs that are necessarily safe. In fact, they're the biggest polluters in the world are military organizations. What they leave behind is really a huge mess. Um, in in uh, the course of things, I became um, executive director of Lay Institute, which I'd mentioned in, in the intro portion of this. And uh, Dorothy wanted to put something together on the mind effects. So we put together a closed conference that involved a number of people. Um, Garth Nicholson, who some of you may remember from the uh, Gulf War controversy. He was a, a professor at the University of Texas, had trained over a thousand physicians, and he had testified six times in front of the Congress on Gulf War syndrome. He came to our uh, closed conference. We also had Ben Eastland, who I've, I've mentioned enough about. Um, we had um, Elizabeth Rauscher, who's, um, I believe it's like a 195 published works. She's an astrophysicist, geophysicist, and biophysicist. Um, she's currently working on a book uh, for, for my publishing company on um, earthquake prediction and modeling from field work that she did in this area. Um, she'll be talking a lot about ELFs in the course of, of, that, uh, of that work. 
Um, it's more scientifically oriented, although we've asked her to mix kind of her storyline uh, into that. So those of us that don't have those math skills, including me, can at least understand the basic concepts she's trying to get across. Um, we also had Rosalie Bertel. Um, we had two um, electrophysiologists from Finland who also um, are involved in uh, regulating medical applications of lasers in, in Russia. One of them directs the group that, that does that. Um, we had, um, who else do we have there? We had, one of, we had a really uh, well-known banker in Alaska there that was there to do filming for us. He had a film company uh, and to help some of these guys with some of their ideas and concepts. Um, but everybody that we brought in were people I had known for over 10 years who had been kicked really, really hard by the establishment and stood up and st dusted themselves off and maintained their ethical line uh, and their direction. So we brought them in to talk about mind effects. And Ben Eastland actually was, was pretty interesting. And in, in what he said is that when he, when he went to DARPA, and he knew Tony Tether on a first name basis, he was running DARPA at the time, and most of the directors. And when he went around and sort of talked to them about um, mind effects, um, what he said to me is, when I asked him to come to the conference, he said, well, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, 10 being the least interesting, uh, two, three years ago I would have said no. He said, but now it's a 1 or a 2 because as he went through DARPA, nobody was laughing anymore. They take it very seriously. Uh, I mentioned I have a website. There's some do DARPA documents there that deal with this subject that are unclassified. We have probably seven, 800 pages of documents there, uh, materials there. Um, and, it's, and that stuff's all free. I encourage you to go there. It's earthpulse.com, E-A-R-T-H-P-U-L-S-E.com. Um, so the mind effects issue became important to me um, and was important prior to getting involved in, in this work. Um, and, and I want to talk about some of the things that, these are just to remind me so I don't forget. Uh, this book, Between Two Ages, um, this is uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski. Many of you remember him. He's one of the founders of the Trilateral Commission. He was National Security Advisor to Jimmy Carter when he was President of the United States. Um, this book was written when he was at Columbia University um, back in the early 1970s. Um, what's important in, in this book, from my perspective, is if you read it today, it's a history. It's not a forecast. It talks about what would happen as a result of technologies um, from, the, from the Americas, Africa, Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, Asia. If you read it today, it's, it's a, it, it is so right on in terms of its predictions. And some would say it wasn't a prediction, it was a conspiracy. If you're in his shoes, it was planned. We already talked about that. Uh, but it did happen. Okay, now on page 54 to 56 of this book are some really important things. And there were some observations, some quotes uh, from an earlier publication called Unless Peace Comes, which was published in uh, 1969. And in that, there was a chapter uh, called How to Wreck Your Environment, which this is before Earth Day, 1969, so people were still thinking in that frame. You know, and and as, we, as I said earlier, even conservatives in Europe are awake enough to realize you can't destroy this planet without destroying yourself. Uh, and I, I appreciate all of that. But what he said, what, uh, what, he, what he quoted was a guy named uh, J.F. Gordon MacDonald. Um, um, MacDonald was a science advisor for Lyndon Johnson. He was a professor of uh, geophysics um, at, at uh, UCLA. And what he said is, if we could ever figure out how to electronically stroke the ionosphere in just the right way, we could return a signal to the Earth that would manipulate the behavior um, of populations over huge geographic areas. Now, what was important about that is, in 1969, when he made that quote, and in the early 70s when it was re-quoted by Brzezinski, the technology, as far as we know, didn't exist. Um, HARP provided that way to electronically stroke the ionosphere uh, in just the right way. Now, going back to this slide, this is a high-frequency transmitter that, through uh, primary and secondary effects, can actually cover 16 decades of frequency, everything from very low frequency to visible light. Uh, by manipulating the signal and manipulating um, components of the natural environment. Think about it um, as if you're plugging in with this little bitty small transmitter into the earth and then being able to manipulate the earth by manipulating the energy itself and being able to capitalize on that energy, which is huge amount of energy that the earth has available to it, if you could figure out how to trigger it. And that's really what a lot of HARP was all about. Now, this idea of earth penetrating tomography in the ELF range. Within that range, um, if we think about sort of where our brains are at, um, in our deepest states of sleep, 
one to four hertz, delta state, where we're really out cold. Theta, um, running approximately four to seven hertz, or pulses per second, vibrations per second. Um, this is where you are in that kind of twilight stage between awake and asleep, where you're conscious of your dreams. Um, this is where three to six year olds spend most of their time. You know, and if you, I have five children, you know, I, I remember this. I got four grandchildren, I remember this. You know, they confuse the imaginary with, with the real, because this is where they're at. And, and we call them attention deficit disordered, <laughs> and they're not. This is their normal state of consciousness, which is why Europeans are way ahead of the game. They generally don't start their children in school until around seven, um, which makes sense, because then they're ready for the academic learning. Um, approximately seven uh, to, to 12 hertz or pulses per second, the alpha range, that zone, if you're an athlete or a writer, that creative place. I mean, the ideal state of learning is there. And then above that range, uh, the beta ranges, and then, and then further up, where you get increasingly more agitated, um, the higher that uh, frequency goes. What, what there is, and it has been discovered, and, and the book I'm out of now is uh, Controlling the Human Mind, um, what they discovered is frequency following response, FFR. This is the idea of the brain locking onto an external signal and beginning to mirror that signal um, and essentially locking onto that external signal. And these don't have to be very powerful, they just have to be within the window frequencies that the brain will recognize and then you begin to follow them. Consequently, your emotional state can be altered or changed on a, on a pretty mass uh, scale. Now, if you're near field, you have uh, something near you that has a stronger signal within the, uh, approximately the same ranges, you'll tend to you tend to move that direction versus something that's very weak coming from um, the ionosphere. But this did exactly what uh, J.F. Uh, McDonald suggested, is the ELF range could be generated and then this uh, frequency following response created in large segments of the population. From my perspective, this became really, really important. And now that everybody's taken my copy of Earth Rising the Revolution, somebody have a copy of that that you just bought, I could use it. Not that one, I need the Earth Rising the Revolution title so I can quote from it as I'm walking through this. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I need to borrow for just a minute if you'd, if you'd bring it forward. Um, I can't remember them all. <laughs> Thank you very much and I'll get that back to you. Um, the, the thing that... Uh, struck me about this and 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 i'll show some more overheads on this but there was a, a publication called orienteer it's a military journal published in uh, russia uh, there was an article uh, published there on mind effects that was pretty interesting to me um, this was reprinted in uh, the u.s army war college uh, quarterly called perimeters i believe it was a winter of 1998 but you you can look it up um, and and in the article in the u.s you can look up the article name on the internet, it's called The Mind Has No Firewalls. And, the, and I'm just going to read one quote, it's a lengthy article, but I'll just read one quote that kind of puts this into perspective. And this is what it says. A psychotronic generator which produces a powerful electromagnetic em emanation capable of being sent through telephone lines, TV, radio networks, supply pipes, and incandescent lamps. This signal would manipulate the behavior of those in contact with the signal, unquote. And then it goes into a bunch of other um, ideas around the same theme, essentially saying that any of these carriers, uh, you, could, you could manipulate that signal so that you could create this FFR, this frequency following response. What's important, um, and I'll put this in context of, of, of even politics and marketing, the, the frequency following response is taught in every um, uh, college that teaches uh, psychology these days because they utilize um, the, this knowledge. Now this is not restricted in terms of how you can utilize it. So something as simple um, as the flicker rate on a, a television screen can, is sufficient that within 20, 30 seconds to create that response in most people. Now when you come home, most people go home, they watch television, they're tired, they're fatigued, they sit down, they're watching the television, their husband or wife is hollering, dinner's ready, dinner's ready, and they're totally in trance, right? I mean, we've all seen it. Everybody's laughing, right? You've seen it because you've been there. Um, and you are. You're in this light, sort of trance-like state. Well, then you add in the flicker rate and, and how you can tell there is a flicker rate and whether it's a coherent rhythmic signal. Just look at the white wall behind you when it's playing and then you can get a, a, an idea of that. But you can then run the flicker rate in such a way that within just very few seconds you actually are in a very suggestive state. The regular ad, the overt advertising hits you. Most people don't have firm opinions on very much, so you can move a percent or two of the population a certain direction. For political purposes, you can see the ramifications of that pretty easily. 
If you remember during uh, George Bush Jr.'s first election, he got in trouble for using subliminals, where he's using words. And the Democrats, and he had the rats and the stuff, you know, and, and then he got caught and they shut that down. Well, that, that's regulated and, and creates those kind of controversies, but the flicker rate, FFR, doesn't do it. And, and, and I want to mention that the easiest form of mind control, the easiest form, all you have to do is give the population a sense of anxiety, worry, or fear. And as, as soon as you have that in a population, you cannot reach your higher states of consciousness. It is impossible to reach your higher states of consciousness. So the easiest manipulation, the Baptist minister is known for years, and the government's known even longer. <laughs> you know? and, and when you think about it, it's pretty simple. You know, if, if you can let go of the fear, then you can reach these higher states of consciousness where actually solutions can be developed and, and resolutions um, uh, uh, created. Uh, and, and I want to say a little bit more of that because I was, I was alluding to it um, earlier when I was talking about how many people sort of fall off the edge of this work. Usually it's, they, they begin to get fearful. They be, and in this, the alternate energy field, you, know, you see a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. Uh, you're done. As soon as you're there, you're done. You're not going to be effective. You're probably not going to achieve your objectives unless it's strictly by mistake and the randomness of the odds. Um, that is the adversary. And, and I think as we step into each thing that we do, we should only step into what we know we can do. Do that first. The next thing reveals itself. You know, have a general direction. Do what you know absolutely in your heart and in your mind you can accomplish. You'll do it with confidence. You'll do it fearlessly. Um, and people have asked me, aren't you afraid? Aren't you afraid? No. The answer is no. I never have been. And the minute I am, I stop this work because then I've gone beyond the capability that I believe I can achieve. And I think all of us have to start to think about that because the fact is if we're in fear and anxiety, we cannot function in the way that we were designed as human beings to function. When, when you think about this idea of affecting human behavior on a broad scale, utilizing any electromagnetic carrier, um, when has this been used? You know, they, after the first Gulf War, Bush Sr., it was Scottish media that reported that we utilized this on a project, Project Solo, which is an aircraft that we use in the, uh, in the battlefield environment. We interfere with people's communications, but we also piggyback signals. And in, and in that news report, it was suggested that what we did is we took the um, stations in the, in the region that were broadcasting the, the Muslim music and prayers, and we embedded a signal on it that created anxiety and fear. And if you remember that first Gulf conflict, you watch the fourth largest army in the world collapse like kindergartners on their first fire drill. You know, giving up to a handful of people, masses of, of adversaries in this situation. Very effective technology. When, when the U.S. tests technology, in fact, when most militaries test, test technologies, it's in the battlefield. The reason we got, and, and that 12-day trip we had with Tom Spencer locked onto that ship together, we wanted him to broaden this discussion to not just include heart, but to include the whole array of non-lethal weapons that have been developed um, by the United States and others that we had been tracking. In our, in our book, uh, Angels Don't Play This Harp, Gene Manning and I went and looked at that. We looked at the cooperation between the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense, where they had actually signed agreements for priority funding for non-lethal weapons when they had dual use, domestic use for riot control purposes and other purposes as well as for military purposes. And it was Secretary of, uh, of um, the Air Force, Wynne, W-Y-N-N-E, when he was in his position, had made a, a very controversial <laughs> statement in the U.S. He had said, don't worry about the non-lethal weapons to our adversaries because we tested them all on Americans first. <laughs> a lot of us kind of took offense to that. You know, I mean, it's like that was pretty offensive. It was Secretary of Energy O'Leary, and we quote um, her in Earth Rising Revolution, where she admitted during the Clinton administration that over a half a million Americans had been victims of human experiments in the United States over a 40-year period without their consent. Half a million Americans, and no one has ever been held accountable for any of it. And from my perspective, that's within the boundaries of our country. Outside of our country, I would suspect even more. I mean, in Canada, there were actually um, civil cases that were eventually won um, for, for mind control experiments that took place uh, there in, in the 1970s. But the opportunity presents itself in, 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 in uh, warfare environments to do exactly that. So mo moving forward a little bit, 
This is kind of one of the pioneers. Um, many of, of you might, might know the name, Jose Delgado, physical control of the mind uh, toward a, a psycho-civilized uh, society. This, uh, this was kind of an interesting read. He, was, um, he got his degree in electrophysiology from the University of Madrid in 1950. Now, most people don't even know such a degree exists today, much less in 1950. Uh, one of my mentors in science, Rejo Michaela, got his degree from the University of Madrid in electrophysiology, class of 58. And he then went from uh, Spain um, to uh, Yale University, where he worked first mapping the various portions of the brain of uh, primates and humans, and then implanting um, uh, electrodes to stimulate various portions of the brain to try and manipulate you know, what would happen and really try to gain a better understanding of the brain. And his famous experiment was he had a uh, charging bull coming at him, and he had a radio transmitter, and he throws the switch, and the bull stops right in front of him. Okay? And that was his dramatic, you know, he's kind of a dramatic guy. And by the 1980s, he had actually developed the same technology where you didn't need any implants at all, just utilizing radio frequency um, energy at one fiftieth of what the Earth naturally produces within the radio frequency range, he could manipulate the emotional state of human beings and primates. Now, like turning on and off a light switch from uh, lethargic and passive to highly aggressive. Now, what he, what he did, now when you put that in perspective, man has created 200 million times more RF, radio frequency energy, that surrounds us right now at this very moment than the Earth creates. And yet the brain can pick out of that soup that specific window frequency at one fiftieth of what the Earth produces. Now, what is that? One, what does that work out to? One, one ten billionth of what is out there around us? So think about it. Um, as a radio transmitter and radio receiver, you know, once you have resonance between the two, you have a nice clear signal. You know, you got the transmitter and the receiver. That's that's what we are on every aspect of us, chemically, um, our our cell structures, our body organs. In fact, the military produced a a, a, a book through the University of Utah. It's a big thick thing. It's called the Radio Dosimetry Handbook, and it's how much loading each of the vital organs of the body can handle in the radio frequency range before they malfunction. So that, and they use this for the base of creating then a number of weapons technologies for doing exactly that, to override the brain, the heart, the liver, the lungs, um, to be able to literally affect the human operator but leave all the hardware intact. Perfect Republican weapon. You don't have to rebuild anything. <laughs> and, and, and this whole concept of non-lethals was really what was, is driving a very different direction. In fact, we, we quote in uh, both uh, Earth Rising Revolution and in uh, angels don't play this harp, this concept called uh, uh, RMA, the Revolution of Military Affairs. And this again comes out of the uh, U.S. Army War College. And it's the idea, what's happening in technology today as it relates to military technologies is we've gone, and they compare it to uh, the earlier RMAs, when gunpowder was introduced to Europe in the Middle Ages and what it did for warfare, what atomic weapons did in the last century for warfare. Energy-based technologies today will replace the things that rip and tear tissue, uh, the ordnance and bombs of the past, will be replaced by energy-based technologies that can target um, hardware, software, and humans. And there was a great article, it was June uh, 2004, it's, called, uh, it's in a publication called Technology Horizons, you can find it on the web. The cover story was called Controlled Effects, and it was the, it's put together by the... Um, Electromagnetic Director of the United States Air Force. Most people don't even... <laughs> okay, it's June 2004, and it's, um, it's called uh, Technology Horizons, and the article is Controlled Effects, the cover story. Put together by the Electromagnetic Directorate of the um, uh, Air Force, and what it, what it basically says is that they're developing technologies, first of all, to uh, target hardware, you know, computer systems, hardware, to be strong enough in terms of its impact to actually melt or burn out circuits. The other is um, a little more subtle, uh, less energy but designed to dis disrupt the flow of electrons through those circuits to cause them to malfunction. And then the third effect is to attack the human operator by overriding any of the five um, senses. And this becomes really important from a standpoint of military because if you can affect the operator, and shut down the operator, then it doesn't matter what kind of hardware they have. It doesn't matter what kind of software is running it. And that's the ultimate target of militaries as they develop um, new technologies. Um, 
the book that, that, I'm, that I'm out of, Controlling the Human Mind, is 250 sources that trace the issue of mind effects going back to the early 1950s when we had returning prisoners of war from Korea and there were like these really patriotic kids had gone over, they'd been prisoners of war, they came back and they're handing out communist leaflets on street corners. And then the phrase brainwashing came into existence because people became very interested and our intelligence groups in the United States became very interested in this and they began uh, starting in the 50s and, and going all the way through today uh, began to experiment in mind control technologies. The ones that got the most notoriety were the MK Ultra uh, programs and the 140 sub programs or so underneath that. Uh, those were just part of the picture and most of those just showed the use of chemicals and chemical constituents that were being used on servicemen and women uh, among others and also other groups of people that were um, disenfranchised kind of groups of people. They were dealing with minorities, they were dealing with orphans, prisoners, people that really didn't have strong advocacy. This is in the United States of America, okay? That this stuff happened. The same things happened in Nazi Germany and we hung people for the neck, by the neck for it. In the US, we hid it away. In fact, the guys who set some of the standards for electromagnetic exposures were actually brought over to the United States on Project Paperclip, which some of you are familiar with, which is where we recruited all these Nazi scientists and brought them over to do work for us under the threat that, hey, you don't cooperate, guess where you're being deported to? You know? And we all know the story there. Um, we, we document that again in, uh, in Angels Don't Play This Harp when Gina and I put that together. That was one of the big shocks for us because the American standards for um, exposure uh, was 1,000 times less stringent than what was going on um, in, in, in Russia and the former Soviet Union. Not to say that everybody was ad adhering to their own observations, but at least they had enough sense to recognize the biological effects of very low energy uh, dosing. And part of that was the way they approached their science. The first paper I ever, I ever did on science uh, was done in, uh, when I was 19, and it was an analysis or a comparison of compartmentalization, the idea of separating science and breaking it into small parts um, for security reasons, which is what the U.S. did. Very inefficient, lots of duplication, lots of waste. And and really a big miss in terms of what you could gather when you combine sciences, which is exactly what the former Soviet Union did. They put together people from all different disciplines, put them in the room together to sort of hack their way through um, science and enlighten each other um, in, in the gaps or the holes in their um, special specialties. When Bernard Eastland um, first became acquainted with us, it was Gene's interviewing of him, and he was very cooperative. And then after the fact, he was like, you know, okay, you guys surprised me. Well, we didn't villainize him. Because we looked at him as, look, he knows this, this much. Let's see if we can wake him up to this much of what's out there in the science. And after that, and he did, after that and everything he published, and every time he spoke to his colleagues, he said, look, don't discount your adversaries when people challenge your technology. At least take in their information, evaluate it as a scientist should, and then make judgments because you can't know everything about every field and sometimes people do bring something to the table that might actually broaden your knowledge. And he took that as a, as a good lesson. As I said, we became friends as, as things moved on because of that. Um, the next slide, this, is, this was interesting. When Gene and I are doing our work, you know, and I'm trying to find this... Uh, source document to show, um, to show sort of the complicity of the CIA in some of this. And I, and I was working for the school system and as one of my functions I managed a big surplus area. So we had all these surplus books and I'm talking to this guy about uh, needing this source because it's everything secondary, tertiary. I'm trying to get a root source to give me what I need. And I reach in this box behind me and I just pull out a book and it was this one. Just as I'm talking about it. You know, I mean, there's, 10,000 books in this place, and I pulled this one out. Now, what was really good about this is this is just before the Freedom of Information Act passed. This is right after the Watergate. Um, and remember, there was the CIA, oh, ex, excuse me, ex-CIA uh, guys that broke into the Watergate. You remember that? And the only ex-CIA guys are like six feet under and dust, you know, because <laughs> they really never finish, you know, and they always call back into service. Now, Richard Nixon was really an evil guy from my perspective. Um, if, if there's, he hated uh, Hale Boggs, who, who was disappeared with my dad. Um, but 
the, the last set of tapes that were released from Watergate actually have him cursing about Boggs because he was so angry uh, at J. Edgar Hoover because J. Edgar Hoover had tapped every congressional and Senate phone line and was blackmailing half the Congress to cooperate. Uh, and he had way, way too much power. He maintained a whole set of secret files on people. And Boggs didn't like it very much. And he wanted him out. And six months before they disappeared on a plane, and just before uh, J. Edgar Hoover went away, he was calling for his resignation openly on the floor of the Congress. And he was angry at the security agencies, particularly the CIA, which was engaged at that time in, 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 in infiltrating um, protest groups for the Vietnam War. They were involved in opening domestic mail, uh, domestic uh, wiretapping, um, and for the mind control experiments which are cited in this publication. Now, has anything changed? It's the same game going on now. You know, they change the names, get a few more alphabet soup organizations to do it. We're in the most controlled, monitored society of our history. Earth Rise and the Revolution, uh, I wrote with James Roderick in, uh, in, in, and released it in 2000. And there are, as recently as the last week, I'm reading uh, mainstream press reports talking about stuff we wrote about 12 years ago. And this is 650 sources in this book. I consider it the most important book I wrote dealing with privacy issues, technology issues, and how they interrelate. It was pre-9-11, and it was written as a warning because after 9-11, everything we suggested would happen as a result of that evidence has, in fact, um, happened. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it was a Democrat or Republican uh, in, in the White House. Um, Obama did as much or more uh, to maintain that um, kind of a syndrome where we become more transparent and government becomes more opaque. You know, transparency as government is kind of the, the words I hear in Europe a lot more than I hear them in the United States. And, and, and I think we're becoming more like what Soviet Russia was in the United States, and they're becoming more like we used to be. And, and, and it's just such an upside-down equation. Um, but when you slice off freedom one slice at a time, eventually the baloney's all gone. <laughs> and, uh, and we're real close to the, the end of that one. Um, but there is no uh, privacy, and ultimately the domain of the human mind um, is, in fact, the target of U.S. military. In fact, they let two contracts uh, a couple years ago um, for, to the University of California, one for monitoring brain activity within a human being to determine specific thoughts. Now, here's the deal, is the resolution on this increases as our computer power increases. So you think about the stuff they were talking about in 69, which is kind of gross moving of emotional state. There was a guy named Persinger at Laurentian University who actually wrote a paper on this in 1995 where he said what you could do as simple as create a complex signal that creates a sense of anxiety in the population and then just shove a press release into the mainstream media so people watching the news that night see a certain group being indicted for all of your ills and then a certain amount of that emotional anger would turn in that direction. Something as simple as that. But as our computing power and our ability to generate specific signals increases, the resolution increases, our ability to do more on a more refined and more refined basis. So they let this contract to the University of California to monitor brains and see in real time what a thought looks like. And then the other contract was to take and model that waveform and then put it on another person to see if you could, in fact, transfer information between people. And they wanted to do this for two reasons. One is for uh, communication with your own troops in a battle environment without any hardware, and the other was to disturb the thinking process of your adversary. This is the direction in which our military is going, and we think a very dangerous direction because it, it interferes with free will, quite frankly, something that in most religious traditions even God will not do. Certainly, government does not belong in that arena. When I think about our Constitution, you know, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, you know, these basic freedoms imply a freedom of thought. So the idea of any government interfering with that I find highly repugnant, as do most human beings on this planet. And yet this is the direction uh, that we, con we continue to go. This one is a really interesting one. It comes from low intensity conflict and modern technology. Um, and, and, and this is uh, Captain Tyler. Uh, he's dead now. Uh, thank God he's gone. Because this guy interfered with more good science um, than, than anyone on the planet in this particular area. But he looked at all these really esoteric things that weren't very well documented. The guy who wrote the foreword for this book, it came out of Maxwell Air Force Base, was a Newt Gingrich, who's really excited about all this cool technology from his perspective. But this particular um, uh, chapter deals with 
sort of the anomalous side of, um, of the technology. And, and in particular, he gets into what he calls anomalous human capabilities, what we used to call extrasensory perceptions, <laughs> you know, the six senses, and the idea of manipulating, um, uh, manipulating that in such a way as to be advantageous. In fact, um, at, our, at our Mind Effects conference, a closed conference, the thing that startled me the most is everyone in that room felt that the next evolution of humankind was the awakening of that sixth sense in all of us. And I believe that was the thing the military discovered, that we all have this innate God-given, uh, creator-given, however you want to look at that ability that our belief systems inhibit, and a lot of other things inhibit. But consider, um, consider transparent government if we all had that capability. I mean, it would be judgment day, right? I mean, it would be judgment day on a fundamental level because if we're totally transparent, and so is every other human being. We have to be pretty forgiving human beings. And maybe that's our highest human attribute, after all. You know, we saw it. Truth is worth something. Truth is worth finding out. There needs to be whistleblower mechanisms for the private sector and the public sector that actually work. There needs to be real truth commissions, like what happened in South Africa. You know, look at what happened there. People had an opportunity to come forward, tell the truth, be forgiven, or else be prosecuted severely if they didn't. We need that. In Western Europe, we need that in the United States. An opportunity for people of conscience to step forward, acknowledge our mistakes, clear the slate, and start again on some of the things that could advance humankind rather than suppress it. Because these technologies are about suppressing it. The military is not known for any high human affairs except killing each other. It's the wrong group to be controlling science. Think about science today. How many people in our legislators, uh, in our legislatures around the world or our parliaments have any scientific background at all? And yet what makes governments the most powerful in the 21st century is the command and control of high science, which means if we're going to operate within democratic republics and democracies as citizens, we have to have a certain level of knowledge. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to know how to build all this stuff any more than most of us can even repair an automobile today. <laughs> it's something we used to be able to do. But we can still drive it from place to place. Conceptually, we need open debate on weapons concepts so we, as a citizenry, can direct our governments on the way in which they should go. And we have the opposite. We have a military academic complex and an uninformed, in our country, an uninformed Congress that on the most classified of research, only the congressional leaders can be present. They can't discuss it with anyone. They can't bring experts in to refute what they're being fed. And they don't have the background knowledge to even, even approach it. I mean, we've got a couple of doctors, a couple of MDs, a few people out of 535 that have any science background at all within our Congress. That is a huge, huge hole in a modern society, the one that we built around us, that depends on technology for our very existence and drives so much of where we're at. That's why we're in the mess we're in right now, quite frankly, because policy is not keeping up. Technology used to double every five years. This is back in the 1980s. That's from the invention of the wheel to where we are then. Today, it's about every eight or nine months, technology doubles. We can't keep up with the regulation. We have to look forward, looking at the base of knowledge that we have now, look forward and begin to regulate the technologies that, that are actually dominating our lives today. If we'd been doing that for the last 20 years, if we'd been exercising at least what they attempt to do here in Europe was a precautionary principle in environmental and health issues, you, know, you sort of anticipate it, you let the whole world know, hey, there may be this problem, you know, so at least we have a decision point to make that each of us can make in deciding how to push policy forward. Um, going from this one, the future of mind control, Economist, 2002. You know, and here, this article isn't getting into technical aspects. What they're talking about is the ethical aspects of should we, shouldn't we? Because they were convinced in 2002, 10 years ago, the technology was profound enough to be the, the cover story. And I, and I think that's an important publications, one of the better publications in terms of uh, global news that I've read uh, and read, and, and to see them involved in this. And then it gets dropped. The same with the European Parliament. You know, we push it forward. We demonstrate a device even in, in, in the earlier part of that hearing. Um, and it gets dropped. Now, why did it get dropped? And I forgot to mention this. Tom Spencer, our champion, Foreign Affairs Chairman, he was, he was told and, and, and asked and, and, and cajoled to kill this. And I mentioned he had run the Globe Group 
Well, the one guy who ran Globe before him was Al Gore. Well, when Tom Spencer called Al Gore on the phone, and I'm in his office at the time, and Al Gore stayed at his home in Surrey, and he stayed at his home in Tennessee, he wouldn't take the call. He wouldn't take the call over the harp issue. And then when Tom Spencer sits on the hearing and nobody would show up, NATO sat in the back of the room and listened, but they would not testify. They would not come forward. And afterwards, after the, the hearing, they spent two weeks trying to discredit me on the basis of my credentials. I'm not a scientist. I'm a reporter. <laughs> I, could have, I could have no education at all and still be able to do that as long as I document my material. And that's why I'm very insistent on it. It didn't work because we had given them three feet of materials the committee threw NATO out of every office they went to. But when the resolution did pass, three days later, Tom Spencer's political career ended. And it was in a scandal over, he was conservative from Great Britain. Three days after that hearing, they lost his luggage and uh, going back to Great Britain. Now, he had diplomatic papers, they're not supposed to go through his luggage. He had, uh, he was married, had children, adult children. He was uh, gay and smoked marijuana. And as served in Great Britain, it didn't kind of go together very well. So he, re he basically had a press conference in his front yard, and he said, unlike Bill Clinton, he said, I didn't hail. <laughs> Which I really appreciate, Tom Spencer, because at least, and, and, and more than anything else, he's an honest man, the kind of person you really want in public life. But he, he stepped aside, he finished out his term, which was a few more months, and then he didn't stand for um, uh, that appointment again. And, and it's unfortunate, you know, I called him afterwards, I said, you know, my dad used to say, you know, when you're in office, you've got to deal with everything from dog catchers to liquor licenses. I said, now you've got the ability to pick your place, you know, to find out what it is that really motivates you and, and focus on that. And it was, he got involved in um, economic development um, and was funded through The Hague, because they have a little bit more liberal view <laughs> of these issues, and, and they weren't big issues for them, because they're very effective uh, political leader. But the fact is, he was, he was a big casualty. We lost our advocacy uh, in the European Parliament, which is really where we wanted to move this issue uh, a little bit further. <coughs> this didn't show up. Navy regulation, November uh, 2006. You can get it off my website at earthpulse.com. But this was just adopted by the Navy in 2006. And the reason it's up there is the mind control um, issue is addressed with those words, mind control experiments. Um, and those have to be approved by an undersecretary of the Navy in order for them to carry those experiments out. So they still go on, they're open about it. Um, you can look under requests for proposals, RFPs of the various branches of the military, and you'll see plenty of opportunities to bid on projects, to bring projects forward in this regime. You can look on our website and see some of the DARPA documents in this area. But the thing that, that, that came, came forward in all of this is the realization that as they looked into what human beings were capable of, this is what scared the hell out of the military. Because everyone in this room has the capability of developing these higher attributes, these capabilities. Now, could you imagine a dozen or a million people on this planet? The next evolution of human beings, I believe, is that direction. People say, well, how are we going to change things? That's how we're going to change things. Letting go of our fear, recognizing what we are, and look for ways to enhance our capacity as human beings so we can make the changes that are necessary on this planet. And, <laughs> this is a, a simple technology. Many of you are probably familiar with Hemisync. How many are familiar with Hemisync? A few. Okay, this is a whole brain coherence. Um, you can actually, I think the next slide gives it. Yeah, this is right out of the patents. Uh, the patent number is there. Um, this is sort of the before, and there's the after effect. Now, take a look at left brain, right brain. That's what you're looking at there. Take a look back. On the right side, facing the screen, is a normal brain. Hemisync resonates both hemispheres, a creative and analytical side to run together, the way that they were intended to work. You know, we hear a lot about left brain, right brain, people are this way, people are that way. We are both ways if we're properly organized. You know, when little kids, I was mentioning little kids operating mostly in the theta ranges, they also tend to show more whole brain coherence. And then we educate them and really screw them up. And they become one side or the other dominant. And as they get older, it becomes more and more pronounced. 
Hemisync is just one technology of many that brings things back uh, into balance. So within 30 seconds to a minute, you get a whole brain effect. He, uh, Monroe achieved um, a patent in this. And this whole brain effect unifies both sides of the brain. And then through a number of uh, programs that, he's, that he developed, um, you can do all kinds of very unusual things. And, um, and I, w I would suggest, uh, take a look at, um, again, our website. We have a whole array of Hemisync available there. Um, it's Earth Pulse, again, earthpulse.com. But Hemisync is like the cheapest, easiest way to get there. You know, it's like, and they, they organize them for um, accelerated learning, for quitting bad habits. Some of them have voiceovers, but you can hear them. You can dial it up so that you can actually hear what those subliminals are. And I really recommend that if you ever use subliminals, make sure you know what you're hearing, because some things can conflict with your belief systems. Like an example, I can say dog in the room, and some people get all warm and fuzzy, and other people get terrorized, right? So you really want to be mindful about what you're putting in, because you re really are programming, and this is primary programming. And, and my belief is that there are a lot of tools out there for stimulating the brain. There's uh, biofeedback technology, learn how to do this without hardware, so that you can actually work with your brain. They're using it in attention deficit disorders and hyperactivity for children in a number of school districts in, in the United States right now. And what they're able to do is they're able to take kids and they'll have, in, in one case, they use a cap, um, a cap that's like a, uh, looks like a bicycle helmet, has a number of electrodes, usually eight or, or 16 channel uh, setup. And so they monitor brain activity in real time and then for, they'll have on a computer screen like a bouncing ball. So the kid is trying to make the bounce uh, hit a certain range. And when they do, it's when they're in that ideal state, that alpha range for learning. And after 30 to 40 sessions of about an hour apiece, they don't need any hardware. They can go there right now. They don't need Ritalin. They don't need any drugs. They're not going to destroy their liver. They can actually clearly get into that learning space. You can use them for relaxation, meditation, accelerated learning, um, and sleep, as an example. And a lot of other things for stimulating the brain to reach higher capacities. There's light and sound devices that do this. There's electrocranial stimulation that can do this. Those are a little bit sloppy because you've got to use gooey electrodes. But light and sound are good if you don't have epilepsy. <laughs> You're going to trigger a bad, a bad situation. But they work really well. And, uh, and those technologies are relatively flat and simple. Biofeedback, uh, another technology that's relatively easy um, to begin to learn how to utilize. You know, we have gyms for learning how to be physically fit. We have technologies to be more mentally capable. And, and they're things that enhance our ability to perform, allow us to learn how to deal with stress in a much different way, and make us more powerful uh, human beings by being able to utilize what we truly are um, as human beings. So, ideas regarding HARP, because I was supposed to talk about weather modification. <laughs> weather modification is a concept, um, may or may not be, is it good or bad? You know, and here's my view of that. And, and, and Ben Eastland came to this. At the end of his, of, of his time on this planet, he had made the decision to not share anything about weather modification with the military because he felt they were irresponsible. If we're going to do anything in this area, if, big if, we have a lot further to go with our ability first to model the planet, to understand what we're doing, because you may create one solution in one place and ten problems elsewhere because we can't model the planet's systems efficiently enough yet. But if we're going to move in this area, it needs to be done in the open light of day, very, very slowly, with civilian sectors and all governments of the world, not just one or two, uh, engaged in this kind of uh, work. Pollutants removal uh, using RF. Interesting idea. Again, moving very carefully. And a warning that Rosalie Bertel gave and now she's deceased, so I give the warning again, is these are the kinds of ideas that the military would use to get you and me as the public to support programs like HARP. But remember all of the other potentials in these programs and the risks associated with them. Militaries are not the responsible parties they need to be. Civil governments are. Civilian sector is. At least got a fighting chance of open debate based on debate across the facts rather than uh, the fiction that the military produces on a pretty regular basis. And they do it to manipulate, they do it to control, and they do it to gain funding, and ultimately to achieve their paranoid objectives, which is really what, what they're about, as I said in the very beginning of this presentation. Energy as a, as, as, as a weapons, and it's related to technology. Again, 
if you don't destroy all the property, maybe you don't have to rebuild. But maybe if you don't go to war in the first place, you don't have any of these problems. War is becoming too easy. These new technologies make it easier every day. When people can sit in the middle of the United States and run drones anywhere in the world, the distance between the killing is, is too far. You know, when, when, when our fathers or grandfathers went to war and they came back from war, they still had the smell of it in their nose. They didn't want you going there. They did everything they could to avoid it. It's now become too easy to kill without that same connection to what you're doing. This, we have to keep this in mind. You know, military personnel can't really object. You know, they lose their civil rights as they step into that game. This is a very dangerous situation as, as we move forward because high technology literally runs the world today. When you look at um, a metaphor for change in new technology, you know, I use this concept of, of technologies as an opportunity to really talk about what it takes to empower us to make change. And, and it really starts with changing ourselves. That's where it begins. People say all to me all the time, what can I do? What can I do? How do I protect myself? Well, first of all, that's the wrong position to take because as soon as you do, you've already told me the first problem. You're already fearful. That is the adversary. One step at a time. If it's not these issues, everyone in this room has an issue you're passionate about, that you care about. I don't care what it is. Step up. Do something that you know absolutely you can achieve. We each have a sphere of influence. It may be just our family and a few close friends, or it might be the reach into government. Exercise what you can do, not what you can't do. Recognize there's millions of others doing the same. I once asked a priest, what's faith? And he couldn't describe it. I can tell you what it is. It's acting on what you know to be right and true. Doing something, changing something. We can all do that. And together we can change the world. Thank you very much. Are we out completely out of time, or do we have any for questions? Probably out of time, yes? No? Take a couple questions. Someone's controlling the microphone and the time clock. <laughs> I'll take your question, and, and you're seeing that no one's saying we can't. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'd like to know your take on the ET dimension. I, I really don't have a position on that. Uh, I've attended a lot of the UFO Congresses, and they've invited me to speak on these subjects. There's a lot of other experts that have spent their lives dealing with that issue. No, I'm aware, for instance, that there's quite a high proportion of contactees who come from military backgrounds. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, and uh, one hears stories again and again of weapons being disabled um, by, and so on. Right. So it seems to me that this is an important um, factor. Yeah, it's, it's just not my area. And uh, I appreciate, I, I've read the same kind of accounts, but it's, yeah. it's just not my area. But I appreciate the question. Sir, you had a question there. Uh, hello, I'm... Frank from Denmark, I represent Open Mind Conference here, so uh, next year in September, I already invited Nick Beckett to come. Uh, look for openmindconference.com on the net and see you in Denmark if you find the program interesting. <laughs> I have a, um, a question for you, because I'm all into geoengineering, as we shortly discussed, and all this weather uh, modification. Is that possible to do without all this chemtrails geoengineering we see on the sky today? I believe it is. Um, in, in fact, going back to where some of this began, it was uh, Will Thomas who actually uh, advanced some of the ideas of contrails, chemtrails. And, and at the time, I was publishing his, uh, his, his book on uh, the Gulf War syndrome. And he came to me and, and, and wanted to tie Harp into this, and I asked him, where's your evidence? And he goes, I don't have any. So I quit publishing his work, okay? And he's done very credible stuff out there, but it's not something... I've stayed away from that topic uh, pretty much because it's been... Uh, there's a lot of good information, a lot of bad information. Have they done spraying? Have they done this kind of stuff before? Absolutely, yes. Um, we've documented it. But the thing I've steered away from is you won't see in any of, you'll see 1,600 sources plus 
in our material, but never once will you see uh, a clandestine conversation in a phone booth. I don't consider that evidence. Um, some people do. My standard is if it's published, printed, and I can collaborate it with something, you know, I'll utilize it. And so um, I, I just don't see the whole dimension of that. Now, I know there's others that, that have good information on it. I haven't seen it yet. Um, I spoke with someone here at this conference going to send me something. So I'm very interested in seeing that. Um, my address is easy to find. It's on the Internet again. If you've got material, I'm always open for it. Um, but it has to be factually based and with good sampling. And, um, you know, and then I can do something with it. And it, you know, in terms of, of publication, you know, that whole dimension has changed a lot. You know, because of the Internet, people have done me the great favor of publishing my books and my videos for free. So I'm not really planning on doing any more writing because it's not economic. You know, and it takes a lot of work to do this. And um, so I've moved from different directions. I'm trying to figure out a way to do it because I'm, not, I'm never going to grant sources who are going to tell me what to write. I'm not going to mainstream publishers who are going to tell me what to say. Um, so maintaining independence is like the most critical element of what I do. And the open source is great, but, but how do we make it work? You know, my model was $15 at a time. Worked great. You know, I raised and spent over $2 million on this project. I started with cashing in or a little bit of a retirement to do it. Um, I'm 54 now. You know, I've got to be thinking about that. Someday it's going to hit me. <laughs> and I am. I'm doing a lot of other things. But for, for, the, for the purpose of, of others trying to do this kind of work, find a way to support them. You know, I'm doing okay right now, but there's a lot of people doing good work. Find a way to support them so they can continue to do it. Because investigative reporting isn't something the mainstream spends any money or time or effort on anymore. It's independents that do it. Amen. <laughs> In the back there, yes. Um, I'd like to ask you a couple of quick questions. The first one being, do you have any information about the heart that you spoke of today was the heart facility at uh, Kokona, Alaska. Uh, my understanding is there is a second heart facility at Poker Flats. I wondered if you had any information on that. It, it's, it, there was a small uh, transmitter there. It's been shut down. Um, but it was operating for a number of years. It was used in conjunction with HARP in order to create uh, the over-the-horizon radar effects and a number of other experiments. That one originally was, I believe it was in, Gene, tell me if it was Colorado. Wasn't that one in Colorado and they moved it because it was creating too much interference? And Gene's nodding. I think I got that right. Um, but there's more than that. Arecibo, Puerto Rico has a retrofitted uh, facility. There's a number across Canada that Rosalie Bertel that are based on the same technology spoke about. One in Tromso, Norway, interestingly enough. And if you remember that weird light effect, kind of a corkscrewing kind of motion. They said, oh, it's a rocket falling. I don't believe it. Um, I really don't. Now, this is my opinion. This is not a fact. But my opinion is, is that that was an experiment to demonstrate the capability of the technology. Um, but again, there's no independent monitoring. And the thing about it is there could be, because when you send that much energy up and it's a coherent signal, you ought to be able to pick it out, you know, and, and we just need to see that kind of independent monitoring by credible sources so that we can begin to look at that. And that's something, unfortunately, I believe the European Parliament would have continued to follow up if we had had the champion there that we had in uh, Tom Spencer. And I have one other question, please. Yes. Um, thank you for that. I would like to thank you for bringing the information about Heart Forward, but I've, you know, I've listened to you quite a lot over the years, and I thank you for making us aware of this. But at the same time, I must also ask you, I have a... I listened to you in 2006, and the topic of uh, the, you know, the defense application song came up with Art Bell on the Art Bell Coast Coast program. And uh, you were talking about uh, you know, the, the way that uh, America was violated and, uh, on 9 11. And you said at that time that because Afghanistan didn't, didn't give up the terrorists, that uh, you thought the bombing of Afghanistan was justified, and you said that on the Art Bell program. Yeah. But now, uh, obviously, uh, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you uh, attended Dr. Judy Wood's presentation yesterday. Yes. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, the evidence that she presents is, is irrefutable. Very compelling. It's irrefutable, and indeed she's taken this to court, and I don't believe there was an opportunity to discuss that yesterday. So I wondered if you'd had any shift in your conclusion about 9-11 and how that would affect uh, your, your sort of uh, you know, discussion of 9-11 
from action Absolutely. yesterday. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and there's been other evidence, I think, brought forward, too, that indicates a lot of other things with 9-11. And, and, and I have a very different viewpoint of warfare, all right? And, and a lot of people find it very objectionable, probably in this room. But this is my view of it. I didn't support either one of those wars as a, as a way of solving the problem. But if a country is going to go to war, and we just spent trillions of dollars going into debt over these two wars, my view is, if you go to war, and you really feel justified, and that's the decision that's made, annihilate them. But don't rebuild them. And I believe that. And, and I know a lot of people find it objectionable, but if we really feel that justified, teach them a lesson and don't do it twice. And we, we are in debt up to our eyeballs. We're about to destroy the entire world's economy over two wars we probably shouldn't have been in in the first place. Because we spent trillions and trillions and way too much time interfering with people's sovereignty. If people want a theocracy, let them have it. If they want a democracy, let them have it. If they want socialism, let them have it. Stay in your own boundaries, self-determine your own government, and let's all have enough respect to let people do that. And that's our problem. We interfere with everybody's government and their right to self-determination. And that's really what it's about. I may not agree with somebody doing something next door, but if they're within their boundaries, let them have their own revolution. We had one, <laughs> you know, and everybody else has too. But it's self-determination, I think, is primary. And staying within your boundaries is part of that uh, right to self-determination. I don't care what government you choose. I'll take one more question, then we'll, we'll, we'll stop. Uh, Raphael Kleiman from Norway. Uh, I represent Baldwin and the Open Mind Conference Norway uh, and the Water Conference Norway. Um, uh, a co-worker of mine has done some, some research on, on the chemtrails issue in, in Norway. And um, we have had um, laboratory results showing 10 times high levels of barium, strontium and titanium. Um, and uh, we have had a strange situation last year where we didn't have butter in Norway. I mean, Norway is the richest country in Europe and we don't have butter. We couldn't buy butter because the harvest was destroyed. And this year it probably is going to be the, the same thing. Um, and, you know, I, I know farmers in the neighborhood who are just, just crying. Their, their economic basis is, is destroyed. Um, the, the theory of my co-worker is that uh, barium and strontium uh, titanate um, has a special piezoelectrical uh, uh, properties uh, where, where only very short amounts of nanoparticles of these substances are enough combined with these uh, RAF uh, effects to totally um, undermine the biophoton communication in the cells of the plants. This so is an important point, and, and it doesn't take much. Mm. Um, you can put any, any number of heavy metals or uh, specific, particular elements within, in, in very, very small doses within a, uh, an area. And then you can hit it with RF and actually amplify the effect. So you, you, you would do blood work, like iodine would be a good example. And I think, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was uh, Becker that, that used this in one of his analogies. But basically, you can take iodine, um, and you all need iodine, all of us need a certain amount of iodine uh, to function. But if you overload, you, you can get really sick or you can even die. But you can send an RF signal that will resonate to iodine, trick the body, you'll begin to show all the symptoms of iodine poisoning, and yet when they check the thyroid, do the blood work, it doesn't show up. And very effective, uh, incidentally. In fact, you could utilize it in a battlefield just using the heavy metals and material that's released by the ordnance, that's the bombs and, and so forth that are dropped. So your adversaries have this within their system. You can send a signal in that amplifies the effect, devastate a complete army, and then turn it off and then send your troops in and you're not going to be affected at all. So this is, again, the type of technology can be used. Could be used even against general populations or it could be an accident. You know, I mean, you have the elements available. People aren't familiar with what RF signals might trigger that amplification. You end up with these mystery illnesses that pop up from time to time. And I would venture guess it's probably some complex form of that because RF is everywhere. I mean, and there's no, virtually no regulation within the narrower, narrower bands, because we've discovered that we're more biologically active in these areas than we thought. With that, last question, I'll stop. Thank you all for being here, and again, thank you for supporting this organization.